Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming down to uh, this seminar today. I'm looking actually kind of really deformed in this in this camera, but anyway, that's fine. Um, and welcome to everyone online to this special GA seminar on um, on natural hydrogen. And uh, so, as um, uh, just start the introduction. So, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to people, their people, the cultures and the elders past and present. So my name is Andrew Feitz. I'm the director for low carbon geoscience here at GA and I lead a team that is looking at carbon capture and storage issues, um, hydrogen and also more recently into natural hydrogen. So this is a really fantastic a, um, opportunity to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, our speaker for today is Chris. Um, I'm forgetting your name. That's pretty bad. Chris McMahon. So Chris McMahon is a final PhD student um, at the University of Strathclyde at Glasgow in Scotland. Um, he studied a um, BSc on in Earth Science at the University of Glasgow. Uh, before moving on to a master's at uh, University of Edinburgh. He's in his final year at the moment. Anyway, he's going to introduce this fantastic talk about hydrogen and uh, movement of gases through fault zones, I assume, something like that. But I'll hand over to Chris, so welcome to the stage. Um, thanks, Andrew, for this nice introduction. Yeah, so hi, everyone, in person and online. Um, thanks for coming along today. Um, so today I would like to talk about um, a little bit of research that I've done in my PhD around natural hydrogen, um, specifically natural hydrogen seeps and how we can think about those as potential analogues um, in terms of informing monitoring of engineered geological hydrogen storage. And um, that's something that's gained a little bit of traction around the world. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge at the start um, co-authors on this work. So my supervisors, Jen uh, Roberts, Gareth Johnson and Zoe Shipton at the University of Strathclyde and some external collaborators as well. Um, Katrona Edelman from the University of Edinburgh and Stephanie Flood, who was at the University of Oxford, but has now actually recently moved to Strathclyde. Um, up at Strathclyde, we are based in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And within that, we form like a small group of geologists that make up the fault and fluid flow, um, the FAF research group. Um, and yeah, my PhD is funded by UKRI and um, specifically the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, EPSRC. So with that, I'll get started. A little bit of background, I'm sure most people are aware that hydrogen's gained a little bit of traction, but just to put it in context, um, it's been suggested as a potential fuel that could help diversify and decarbonize um, multiple energy sectors, which I think is why some people find it so attractive. It's also been suggested as one way that we could potentially increase our energy storage capacity. That would allow potentially the expansion of renewables on a larger scale. And crucially for some countries, I think, would allow greater energy security in their like, in the core energy um, market, which is another kind of interesting prospect. To give a UK or European um, background or context to this, the re recent UK government spring budget um, has given um, almost a suggestion of support for hydrogen through 20 billion pounds um, of carbon capture and storage funding. So part of that will be used to develop um, some hydrogen technologies as well as CCS. And a recent um, Committee on Climate Change report has suggested that the capacity for hydrogen storage in the UK is going to increase up to 2030, up to maybe three terawatt hours, and towards 2050, it could go almost up to around 12 terawatt hours of storage. So quite quite large amounts there um, in real terms. And more broadly in the EU, the Net Zero Industry Act, which was recently introduced, suggests that there could be the establishment of a green hydrogen bank with around 3 billion euros um, for green hydrogen technologies. So um, a lot of interest within the UK and Europe. Since we're in Australia, I could not mention the, the landscape here. I suppose that would have been rude. Um, so the domestic demand for hydrogen um, in Australia is actually expected to increase six times all the way up to 2050. And that's part of that, you know, reaching the net zero targets. Um, alongside that, the global demand in hydrogen is expected to significantly increase as well towards 2050. And given that 
about 70% of that increase is focused in the Asia Pacific region. Australia is really quite well placed, in fact, to be a key supplier of that hydrogen market on this side of the globe. So interesting prospects there as well. If we think more about hydrogen storage, right now there's really no large scale porous media storage of hydrogen um, at 100% levels really. Um, that's not to say there's not been experience of hydrogen in the subsurface. Um, in the 60s and 70s in Europe, there was experience using town gas, which was a blend of methane and hydrogen, which was stored in the subsurface. And there's kind of well-documented um, records of that and potential issues as well, which you can draw on. But there has also been significant concentrations of hydrogen discovered in gas fields as well. Um, in Australia, for example, in Kangaroo Island or down on the, the air in York Peninsula. So some interesting prospects as well to consider the fact that that could be co-located alongside natural gas resources. And thinking about engineered hydrogen storage, where exactly would you do that? Well, probably in salt caverns or porous rocks. Um, and by porous rocks, I mean things like saline aquifers or depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. And the latter example there comes with the advantage that depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs may have existing infrastructure that can be reused, which would help reduce the cost as well. And fundamentally for hydrogen storage, the same as other subsurface energy technologies or uses, it's got to be safe, it's got to be secure, and the consequences of potential leakage um, have environmental impacts, but also social and economic risks as well, which you want to minimise. So that's some background. I'm going to dive in and really talk about natural hydrogen seepage now and what that can tell us or what we have learned from that. To show you that this is this is a relevant topic, um, there are some companies right now and there's quite a lot of kind of scientific news coverage of natural hydrogen. So companies like Gold Hydrogen or H2EX here in Australia, they're looking at prospecting for natural hydrogen resources. Um, natural Hydrogen LLC, they're based in uh, North America. And there's two recent articles that have really picked up quite a lot of traction online, especially in social media, um, highlighting gold hydrogen and kind of hidden hydrogen. And these science articles and new scientist articles explore how hydrogen could potentially be a natural fuel source that could be exploited. Um, I'm not here to talk about the, the, the merits of any of that, but that is the, the way that it's been presented just now in, in the media. We identified a gap though in the literature that currently exists and really it's about understanding containment. How could hydrogen be safely stored in the subsurface? If hydrogen was to unfortunately leak from the subsurface, what are the pathways that hydrogen might take through the overburden of a storage site towards the surface? On that, we can draw on other industry analogues. We know a lot about fluid retention and leakage in the subsurface from hydrocarbons, um, from things like radioactive waste storage, but also more recently from carbon capture and storage and really trying to understand how you can ensure that fluids remain in the geological subsurface over geological time. And those analogues are good, but hydrogen's got some unique scientific challenges that are different, and that's why you have to consider it in a different way. It's got unique physiochemical properties and that it's very highly mobile compared to CO2. And there's also the unique challenge that hydrogen storage is probably going to be a cyclic operation which is slightly different to CCS, rather than just injecting CO2 and storing it over geological time. With hydrogen, you're going to be injecting hydrogen and withdrawing it on a kind of demand versus supply basis. So there's some challenges there to think about. So really what we wanted to understand was if hydrogen does seep and get to surface, what do those seeps look like? How, what are the characteristics? Where are they located? What is the mechanism of that leakage? How does it make its way through the overburden to the Earth's surface? And what are the implications for that if you were going to design a monitoring approach for an engineered geological hydrogen storage site? What does that mean? So we'll move into some of the, the real data now, I suppose. Um, where are hydrogen seeps found? This is a small sample of some of what is probably between three and 400 um, hydrogen seeps across the world. This example here involves 13 clusters across the globe and 60 seeps in total. And the reason we've chosen these 60 seeps are because we feel that these seeps are the ones most analogous to a leak from what would be an engineered hydrogen storage site. So we've excluded um, certain seeps based on the characteristics um, and the full methodology on how we've done that is in the paper if you're, if you're interested in exploring that further. But you can see, you know, 
geographically quite widespread and in lots of different regions. The next slide is going to be my anchor slide that I used to guide the rest of the presentation. So I thought it was really appropriate to think about the kind of full cycle of hydrogen um, through generation and consumption in the subsurface through to how it can migrate through the subsurface, how it could be trapped within the subsurface and ultimately what it would look like if it was to get to the surface and leak. Um, and we'll start with that top part at the surface and think a little bit about hydrogen seepage. So we know that hydrogen, when it seeps and gets to the surface, it's got three main physical expressions. It can seep directly from bedrock through rock fractures. It can seep via springs and it would appear on the surface as bubbles. Um, and it also seems to appear in these um, subcircular depression like features that are seen in soils and sediments. Um, so I'll show you what those look like in real images. So top left image shows one of these subcircular depression like features from Brazil. And on the right hand side, there's a similar feature from Russia. So these are the characteristic shape and kind of morphology that you see in these features. On the bottom left, you can see an example of hydrogen gases bubbling through springs. And the middle image that's got the flame is actually an example of hydrogen seeping alongside methane um, through a bedrock fracture. And these actually um, spontaneously ignite at the surface. And that's why you see these flames. So that's the three um, characteristic seepage types. I'll just caveat that with, you know, seepage through bedrock fractures is not always shown as flames, but uh, in some examples, you know, the more extreme examples, that is how it looks. In terms of how much hydrogen do we actually see at these sites? We see hydrogen actually ranging across quite a large value all the way down from 0.0001% all the way up to um, close to kind of 70, 80, 90% hydrogen at these different seeps. Um, this graph shows hydrogen percentage on the left and hydrogen ppm on the right. It's often reported either as a percentage or ppm, so we try to harmonize the units as much as possible to make that easy to view. And the box and whiskers just show the kind of extent of these measurements at each of those clusters that were on the map previously. There's an interesting split in this data. Um, I've, I've put that green line on the slide there just to highlight that split in the data. And you can see that we've got quite a lot of really low hydrogen concentrations, particularly focused in the soil and sediment type seeps. That's those ones with the subcircular depressions, often below 1% hydrogen. And then if we compare that to hydrogen concentrations, say from seepage through water, you can see the hydrogen concentrations are significantly increased there, somewhere between 10 and all the way up to 70-80%. Now there's there's potentially some interesting scientific reasons why that might be the case. It could be the, the way that samples are collected and mixing with air could dilute samples in the soil and sediments example. Potentially for the water examples, it could be that when hydrogen seeps through water, any co-associated gases may dissolve out more readily than hydrogen, meaning that hydrogen concentrations are more elevated when it gets to the, sub, uh, the surface. But I was really not um, entirely convinced when I first saw this plot. So I decided to also plot um, hydrogen concentrations versus the kind of sampling method um, from the field. And that's got a much more interesting split in data into two groups, which is hydrogen measured from what I'm going to call the subsurface and hydrogen measured from the surface. So those subsurface measurements of hydrogen are those that are taken from very shallow boreholes in soil, maybe one meter depth, um, or, or those that are taken from kind of driving a metal pile into the ground or maybe a plastic tube. And you typically get very low hydrogen concentrations there. There's a second group, which I'm going to call surface measurements, which is when hydrogen has been collected maybe in a container at the surface above a spring and then taken back to a lab and analyzed in that way. And this split in data is something that I find quite interesting and something that I'll come on to discuss later in the recommendations. But um, it seems that there's definitely a sampling artifact here as to why we see this, this distinct split in concentrations. This is not a very PowerPoint friendly um, figure, but I'd like to briefly just try and highlight the key points on it. Um, if we think about hydrogen, like in its atmospheric concentration, I can draw a line here and it shows where that would typically be, 0 0.5 parts per million. All the measured um, instances of hydrogen here are significantly above that. So the hydrogen isn't simply just, you know, background atmospheric concentration, it is elevated. So 
there's definitely some process that's generating that other than what you would expect for background hydrogen. If we also look at um, a co-associated gas, which is methane, this is our background level for methane, and you'll see, um, if you look very closely at the side, there's some little purple um, lines being drawn over the methane, and you can see that again, that is significantly elevated above background, and um, particularly in the, the seepage through fractures and seepage through water, you can see that some of those methane concentrations are reaching right up to around 10, 50, even 70% methane in these gases. The relationship in CO2 is not as clear cut. Um, when hydrogen seeps alongside CO2, we have some examples where hydrogen and CO2 are above um, their typical atmospheric concentrations and some where the CO2 is actually below. And given the limited data here, we weren't really able to make robust conclusions or implications on why this is, um, but some more data would definitely help to understand these gas mixtures. And really, it starts to feed into um, what could these gas mixtures tell us about potential sources of hydrogen in the subsurface. But yeah, the data on this isn't great. It's it's quite patchy, um, and it's variable between different sites, and that's one of the issues that we've picked up um, as we've had a look through this. I'd like to briefly focus on the type of seepage through soils and sediments, these subcircular depressions. This is one that has been kind of highly studied. It's really obvious to see on maps. It's something that you can go out and measure quite easily. First plots I would like to show are some of these transects taken across the seeps, and it's transects of measured hydrogen concentrations. And what we can see straight away is that the peak in hydrogen concentration is typically not in the, the centre of the seep. So this line here represents the centre of the seep, and then moving towards each edge. And what you can see is hydrogen concentrations are actually typically highest um, outside or very near to the edge of depressions. So it's definitely not a case that you could walk to the centre of one of these and expect to find the highest readings of hydrogen. Um, and that has some implications for how you want to measure and monitor these types of seeps. To give you an idea of what these look like, there's a LiDAR image at the top left here and just an aerial photograph on the bottom left. But um, this shows you the, the seep, the Arthur Road Bay seep. This is located in the Carolina Bay in the USA. And this is what it looks like on a LiDAR image. And you can see these are the two transects that have been taken across the seep. Um, in this bottom left image, the larger circle would represent higher concentrations of hydrogen measured. And that's just another nice visual to see that some of these really high concentrations are actually quite near the edge or even outside of the seep extent. And in case you don't believe it on that basis, there's one final graph that shows um, hydrogen concentrations across the edge of seeps. Um, this line here represents the edge of the seep. And as we move towards the right of the graph, you get further away from the seep itself. And again, the highest hydrogen concentrations are actually measured slightly out with the edge of that parameter. So we thought that was an interesting observation and has some implications. We tried to put together um, and kind of combine data on leakage rates from papers, but this is something again that's not very well reported. Um, we weren't able to really work anything out in terms of fluxes of hydrogen in comparison to leakage rates. But what we could say on a really basic level is that um, leakage rates of hydrogen tend to increase when you've got a larger area of seepage. And that was really the only conclusion that we could bring from that data. So to summarise, um, it seems like seep characteristics um, are determined by local geology and even hydrogeological conditions. When hydrogen seeps via soils and sediments, we get these apparent subcircular depressions that have a patchy flux. Um, the extent of the seepage seems to control the seep rate in a way. When we get seepage though via these bedrock fractures or into springs, we tend to get more highly localised um, emissions to get a much smaller spatial footprint. And there are some examples of studied seeps that have actually developed over quite a short period of time, so even years. Um, and you can see that on aerial photographs, particularly with the subcircular depressions, where over a space of a few years it went from being kind of normal area of land to having this, this sunken feature. So that's hydrogen seepage. Um, one of the common questions are how similar are hydrogen seeps to CO2 seeps? Um, there are similarities uh, at a basic level in terms of what controls the seep location, 
and their characteristics in terms of how they look at the surface, in terms of shape. But there's also key differences. Um, as I've already mentioned, you know, the mobility of hydrogen means that it's much more easily dispersed when compared to CO2. So the image on the bottom right here um, that shows an example of one of these CO2 seeps from Italy that um, the CO2 has been seeping out of and the CO2 tends to pond um, just above the seep and it's actually quite dangerous. You know, it can cause suffocation and things like that. Um, we don't see any evidence of that so far um, associated with hydrogen seeps. Um, so potentially from a risk perspective, that could be a, a good thing. Um, but I think there's probably more data needed there just to, to make sure that is the case. Um, and if you think about maximum concentrations of hydrogen, they're typically much, much lower than what you see um, at a CO2 seep in terms of CO2 concentration. But again, as the data are quite limited, it's, it's hard to draw many more conclusions than that. I'll come back to this diagram and I'd just like to briefly highlight the, the other three areas that I've not discussed. So in terms of how hydrogen could migrate in the subsurface, um, it's almost your classic examples. Fault zones are well known to be a fluid flow pathway in the subsurface. Hydrogen being highly mobile would likely exploit these pathways if they exist, and that's both vertically and laterally. You could have engineer leakage, so improperly sealed well bores and things like that. Hydrogen will make its way up those types of pathways. You could have hydrogen diffusion through cap rocks, so this example here. And because hydrogen operations are cyclic, that change in pressure um, can actually cause intra reservoir flow um, with hydrogen as well. So that's some of the ways that hydrogen can migrate in the subsurface. There's evidence hydrogen can be trapped, so the, the classic trapping of fluids in subsurface via impermeable rocks probably applies to hydrogen as well, but hydrogen can also be dissolved in subsurface fluids and adsorbed onto the surface of clay minerals as well. Um, so these are some of the ways that, you know, if hydrogen was to escape from a reservoir or a subsurface store and make its way to surface, these are some of the ways it might be attenuated on the way, um, and that's important to think about as well. And probably one of the most uncertain parts of, of this kind of research um, in this area just now is the, the source of hydrogen. Um, there's lots of discussion in the literature on what the sources are. Um, it's not something that's been probably agreed upon widely so far, but there are some sources, very deep natural earth processes that could generate hydrogen and um, fluid rock interactions or even fluid fluid interactions in the subsurface. And that's quite relevant because that could mean that any hydrogen that leaks from a store could be altered on its way to surface. And actually, when it gets to the surface, it might not be hydrogen. It could be a completely different gas. Um, and that's got implications for how you monitor as well. So based on the data that are available, uh, we make some recommendations. Before I make any recommendations, I'm going to caveat it though <laughs> up front. The data are very limited. Um, the data report is quite limited as well. The studies on these seepage sites right now are, are nothing like the studies that have been done on CO2 seeps, and plus there's significant uncertainties in methodology um, that could mean that some of the hydrogen measured is potentially generated by artefacts rather than a natural process. One of the other challenges are that studies on hydrogen seeps right now are more focused on prospecting for hydrogen accumulations in the subsurface. So the, the focus isn't on characterising the seep and what it looks like. Instead, it's actually on could this be an indication there's a subsurface store? And, and that's understandable, but it means, again, that the characterisation of the surface seeps is limited. But even with those caveats, we do make recommendations. I would argue there's still some things to take out of this for engineered storage. We need a clear and detailed methodology, even a standardised methodology across different sites. Um, we really need to understand if you're going to go out and measure hydrogen concentration, what's the conditions in which that was collected? Um, when was it taken? How was it taken? What was the weather like? What was the pressure like? Because there's, there's suggestions in the literature that all of these things could really influence what the concentration of hydrogen is at surface. And I think even more important than that is to rule out artifacts, um, you know, other ways that hydrogen could be produced that aren't associated with a deeper hydrogen source or reservoir. And um, particularly biological sources, so near surface soil microbes and things that can produce hydrogen. Um, but for me, crucially, the one to highlight is this mechanical generation of hydrogen via the drilling process of rocks or kind of hammering in steel poles to rocks to then take these concentration measurements. 
it's, it's well known that that rock crushing process um, causes the generation of hydrogen and you want to make sure that your methodology isn't inherently causing hydrogen production, which you then measure and assume is from a natural source. Um, and I think that um, that could be applied to some previous studies, but that's hard to say given that the methodology is um, at times not, not incredibly detailed in these papers. And um, so that would be one of our recommendations, a clear methodology and making sure you rule out um, artifacts of hydrogen. If you are collecting data, though, there's there's other obvious data to collect. You want the geology, the near surface geology, and um, as well characterized as possible. You want to measure the gases, what the type of gas is, what the quantity of the gas is. If you can measure fluxes, all these things are really useful to have. You want to quantify the seepage area. It's it's a really obvious point that sometimes just isn't isn't reported in the literature. You'd like to know how big these areas of seepage are, and do you have a more widespread area with specific localized points of seepage? This is something that would be nice to understand. Temporal evolution where possible is something that's also interesting. How long has this been seeping for? Is it a long term feature? Is it very short term? Is it sporadic? Does it change? And of course, any indication of the source of hydrogen is something that would be incredibly useful as well to think about where it might be coming from in the subsurface. Um, but of course, that's that's easier said than practically to do. And if you were thinking about monitoring of an engineered hydrogen storage site, these are um, revolutionary results, but you know you want an even grid across your, your storage site um, or your seep location. You want to measure gas concentrations. You want to think about keeping track of temperature and pressure, fluctuations and weather. And there's even been suggestions of things like tides could play a role um, in how hydrogen seeps at the surface. And ideally, you do want longer term or continuous monitoring over seasons and years just to understand inherently if there is a difference between seasons and if there is a seasonality in this release of hydrogen, which some literature suggests um, is the case. So to wrap up, um, we didn't make any robust implications or conclusions thinking about site selection for hydrogen stores. Um, the migration pathways at times are quite uncertain, so we didn't want to, to go down that route. But we do make some recommendations that I've hinted on in the past few slides. So we'd like to see a more standardised and an effective methodology for measuring hydrogen concentrations in the, at the surface or in the subsurface. Um, e is really consistency in the report of this data um, so that you can easily compare different sites of seepage. Some analysis of how spatial how spatially available or how temporally available hydrogen seepage is would be nice as well. Um, and I suppose when you start to think about surface seeps, you have to think about how surface processes might also influence how the seeps are expressed at the surface. Um, you know, this subcircular depression formation process is really not well understood, um, especially onshore. And um, so it's interesting to understand is that because there's hydrogen seeping or is this? Um, is this a surface feature that hydrogen is exploiting to get to the surface? And that's not really been well understood either. Um, and of course, further work to detail and mitigate hydrogen seepage risks is, is crucial as well when you start to think about developing this as an engineer storage site, potentially near areas of population. That's something that is, is really a given that you need. So I'll stop there. Happy to answer any questions. Full papers on the link there. You can get my email and things if you'd like to follow up. But yeah, thanks for listening. I appreciate the time and happy to take questions.